Uh, thank you, Chair. A couple of issues, if I might. Uh, Minister, you referred in your opening remarks to the expectation in the new approach document to a commitment to greater transparency. In fact, the words of the document are a commitment to greater transparency aimed at securing and maintaining public confidence. And a specific of that it was to strengthen special advisor codes. Why then did you weaken the special advisor code on appointments on transparency? Okay. Well, the, I, I, I don't want to preempt the outcome of the inquiry, and I don't want to make direct reference. But the, the, the I think in the public view of this, criticism was that ministers appeared to be going through an exercise in terms of appointment, which is expected and was, wasn't actually happening. Uh, so the question then, I think, in terms of when the parties were looking at this code, was do we go through an exercise or do we just make accountability and responsibility more apparent and more, uh, I suppose, laid down in terms of the code for the minister who has appointed that person, rather than trying to rely on some exercise where people have gone off and conducted interviews and perhaps advertised. There's nothing to stop any minister if they want to go and advertise the post for special advisor, they want to conduct interviews and record the interviews. Where the interest of the department picks up is when the minister brings a name to them and says, I want to appoint this person. And then the Department of Finance has a role in terms of an assessment of the CV of that person. Yes, but the old code had the civics which were props to transparency, like the minister was required to to consider a pool of candidates, which must be broadly based. The selection had to be, uh, the minister's reasons for his selection had to be recorded. Each stage of the recruitment process had to be recorded and retained for at least a year with corporate HR. You stripped all that out. Now, your reason for stripping all that out seems to have been because people like Jonathan Bell ignored it, were simply handed a spad rather than making any selection from a pool of candidates. People like your predecessor uh, got into trouble with the RHI inquiry because he tried to pretend that he had consulted someone to be a spad and then that someone came along and said, he never asked me. So your response to the past <clears throat> breaches of the code is simply to validate that situation by no longer requiring any of those transparent acts. Surely that's weakening and a backward step. Well, it would not be more important to enforce rather than to validate the breach. Well, it depends where you see the, the greater need for transparency and accountability. Uh, I think the, the greater I suppose attention paid to this in terms of the inquiry was in the activities of a special advisor while in office. The uh, responsibility they had to a minister or not, as the case may be, was, was, was a grey area. The issue of a minister setting the pay for their own special advisor. Uh, these were areas that we felt needed strengthened as a consequence of the emerging uh, discussion from the RHI inquiry. Of course, the RHI inquiry may invite us to revisit but, the issues that you're raising, and if that's the case, we certainly will yes, revisit them. Yes, but I remind you, Lord Justice Cochran was very taken yeah. with the flagrant breach yeah. of the Code of Appointment. He came back to it many, many times, because it was so stark. I just don't understand, within a context where there is an exhortation to strengthen the codes, to give greater transparency, that your response to that is to strip out the very components of transparency and to validate the very wrongdoing so as it can happen again. There's nothing now under your code which would stop a Jonathan Bell or a Martian O'Millier doing what they did. And you have validated that and said that's okay under the guise of transparency. It's the very opposite. Well, I would argue with you, and as I say, if the RHI inquiry makes some specific recommendations, I'm happy to revisit, but I would argue that the greater issue 
was the behaviour of spe some special advisors, and not all special advisors, yeah. some special advisors in office, the accountability that they had <coughs> to their own minister, uh, and the responsibility that that minister had for their behaviour, and that is all made very specifically uh, enforced in the new code, yes. including as well the decision in relation to the pay afforded to a special yes. advisors has been taken out of the hands of the minister. But I'm, fo I'm focused on, <laughs> I know on the Court of Appointments, yes, yes, and I the Court of Appointments is something you have watered down. And you know, I'm sure the public don't need reminded that these are public appointments to public positions paid by public money. And yet the one post across the public sector that you can be gifted without any record being kept, any process whatsoever being recorded, any consideration of others out of a pool of candidates, the one post in the public sector that you can now be appointed to is a special advisor courtesy of the weakening that you have delivered on the Code of Appointment. Well, you think that is meeting the expectation of yeah. public in terms well, of transparency? Can I say, I bring Sue in now, the, the question is, uh, the special advisor is a different appointment than they become a temporary civil servant, but they are in, sense, in essence a political appointment. It has to be someone that a minister is, is, is comfortable with. Not that. Yeah, well, then the question is, are we more concerned with how they get there or what they do when they are there? And Both? For, for, for me, the, the, the bigger focus uh, in relation to inquiry has been in relation to. It's not, uh, not mutually exclusive. Well, you can have both. Uh, as I say, if the inquiry makes a recommendation in relation to it, I'm happy to revisit it. Uh, but my concern <coughs> in terms of getting uh, the appointments made within the very quick time frame that we had to get special advisors in place was to ensure that once appointed, the lines of accountability were very, very clear for them. Just, um, I mean, obviously, in developing this uh, new code um, and the contract, I mean, obviously, we did a lot of work in the working group. But we actually looked at the other jurisdictions, and so a lot of the words that strengthen the code have come from what's in place in the other jurisdictions. In the Sorry, it doesn't strengthen the code of appointment. No, no. I know you want to talk about the code of appointment. No, conduct. no, I don't actually. The code of no, 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 no. I'm really happy. It. Well, what I was going to say is that in the other jurisdictions. People, the other, they recognise the relationship between the special advisor and the minister. They recognise that it is a personal appointment and that actually a minister can make the decision as to who they want to appoint. They give that name to the civil service and then the contract is put in place. And so what we're saying is what happens behind the scenes before then, that is a matter for the appointing minister. It's at the point then they, they provide the name to us and then we go forward. With respect, Ms Gray, other jurisdictions have not had a public inquiry exposing the scandal of special advisors well, I think in many has, regards. Well, I can think of, uh, you know, there has been the odd public inquiry that has looked into the activities of special advisors mm. in, you know... Mm. So, so, so do you dissent from my summation that your answer to the wrongdoing in terms of the use of the old code on appointments was, is now simply to validate that so you don't have to submit anything to scrutiny. Well, Isn't that a fair summation? We are given, we are given the name of who the minister oh, wants to appoint. Yeah, you're given the name, yeah. but you don't have to keep what you used to have to keep, a note of why, a note of the process, uh, and the fact that other candidates were considered, like the old uh, scheme had a tick box exercise where the minister had to answer the questions, have I a clear idea of the requirements of the job and the person to do it? Have I created a wide enough candidate field? <coughs> have I selected unjustifiable grounds from the pool of candidates? Has the character check vetting process been completed? Have I a written record at all stages of the appointment and selection processes? All one might have thought in the interest of transparency, very fair questions. But are now liquidated. Removed. Arguably, then a minister could tick those boxes and say, and did, and did, and then when it came to the behaviour of a special advisor in the inquiry, they said they were responsible but not accountable. Yes, uh, look, so you'll get no arguably, argument. Which is a greater from, transgression. No, you'll get no argument from me of the abuse of the code, of the appalling behaviour uh, of Jonathan Bell and others. Uh, no argument whatsoever. But that, instead of addressing that mischief. You simply seek 
to remove the mischief by removing the requirements. Because we want to place the responsibility very firmly and squarely on the shoulders the of the minister. can now do anything. He can pick. He can yeah. pick. And they will he can pick his daughter. He can pick Sorry. his wife. Will, he can pick anyone. They will answer for that. Uh, well, but, sir, Minister Jim, I mean, if, 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 if the same, chair, same requirement was put into the, the staff at perhaps MLA's point, then we could have we could have another discussion in relation to that in terms of picking their family members. But the issue Sorry, here. MLA's have to advertise their post. Fair enough. Yeah. There seems to be a, 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 a very fortunate family members who fit the bill uh, time and time again. But that aside, the responsibility is very clearly on a minister now, where perhaps in the, depart in the inquiry it wasn't so clear in the minister. So however the minister arrives at the appointment, they are responsible for the special advisor. The special advisor has had the code in terms of their own behaviour strengthened, and there will be further strengthening of the codes of the Northern Ireland Civil Service of which the special <coughs> advisor becomes a temporary uh, civil servant. There will be further strengthening of the ministerial codes in relation to their own responsibilities. Uh, as I say, this is done in anticipation, uh, or, or anticipation that there may well be further issues which arise from the inquiry which require further work uh, in yeah. terms of its recommendations. And if that's the case, then these can be revisited. Chair, could raise one <coughs> final point? Yes. Um, <coughs> you very frankly said that the only new money under the new approach is $760 million. That's from our estimation of it. Yes. Uh, and the, the expectation of requirement runs into billions. It was evident from reading the document, was it not, that there was no a guarantee on the cash. There was no figures against anything. So is it a fair observation to say that you and the other parties signed up to the agreement blind as far as the money was concerned? Well, I think it would be fair to say that from our perspective, in terms of negotiation, I can only speak on behalf of my own party and not the other parties. We hadn't concluded the negotiation. Uh, the two governments went out and published the document unannounced to anyone else. But then you accepted it. Well, we the, the, the question in that, and I don't doubt that's the way it was framed. Uh, mm. I mean, our primary concern in it was the political side of the document and whether it was sufficient in that, in terms of re, of, of re-entering these institutions, which we concluded there was. The uh, the expectation that you talk about created was not through the submission of wish lists on behalf of the parties. <coughs> carefully worked out document between all of the party representatives, senior civil servants, senior people in the NIO, uh, in which we were given a very reasonable expectation that this was the, uh, this was the expectation that would, would be met. Uh, so the fact that the government is not as forthcoming as they had promised to be uh, is something that we intend to continue to pursue with them. But we didn't all sit down, as, certainly as far as our party is concerned, sit down and agree a document and say we're good to go, go publish it. A document was published with no forewarning to the parties on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. Uh, finally, Chair, could I ask Ms Gray, all the, what's called the wish list, the wish list issues in the agreement, will all those be subject to a business case to your department? Not. I mean, what we're, what we're currently doing is we are going through this exercise where we are costing, uh, we're getting departments to tell us what the costs are of the various initiatives, and then we have an exercise to do where we will, you know, prioritise those uh, the, those commitments, um, and obviously at the stage when uh, you know departments want to bring them forward, they will be subject. As appropriate to a business case. Well, as appropriate, or they're oh. not always appropriate. No, no, business. they would always be appropriate <coughs> if, there was, if they were below the delegation level. Oh yes. Yeah. Yes, I understand so, that. But they will, of course, be subject to a business case. Which has to demonstrate value for money. Yeah. Thank you. And that's why the issues that were in the document were carefully discussed worked through with senior officials yeah. in the Department of Finance, the head of the civil service, <coughs> and senior officials in the Northern Ireland <coughs> office. But not costed. Not, not, not costed uh, yeah. at, the, at this particular yeah. stage. Thank you. We had, we had some costs, so I should say we did have some costs of some of them, but actually not the whole package. Okay, thank you, sir. Matthew, just sure. a very quick follow-up. Yeah, I did a really quick point of information.